Welcome to Philanthropy in Action, where we uncover the wonderful stories of people who give their time, talent, and treasure to change the world. These are stories of philanthropy. I am Maxim Thorne, and I teach Philanthropy in Action at Yale University. I'm thrilled to have today Julia Ballandina and Noah Beckwith with us. Thank you so much, Julia and Noah, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. We also have our brilliant and dedicated Yale students participating in the conversation. Students, please introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Connor Bell. I'm from Lynchburg, Virginia. I'm a junior majoring in history of science, medicine, and public health. Hello, my name is Mario Spalaris. I'm from Newark, Delaware, and I'm studying political science. Hi, my name is Ari Abraham. I'm from Flushing, Michigan, and I'm studying global affairs and international development. My name is Claire Davis. I'm a sophomore from San Antonio, Texas, studying ethics, politics, and economics. My name is Christina Lee. I'm a junior from San Jose, California, and I study history. Hi, I'm Stephen Banks. I'm a senior computer science major from Detroit, Michigan. Julia Ballandina is a recognized expert in impact investing, advising family offices, high net worth individuals, governments, and banks around the world on development and implementation of impact investing programs. In addition to teaching impact investing at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, she's on the board and investment committee of CIFM, the Development Finance Institution of Switzerland. She holds an MBA and PhD from the University of St. Petersburg, Russia, and is a chartered financial analyst. Noah Beckwith began his career at The Economist Group, covering Africa and the Pacific for The Economist Intelligence Unit and The Economist newspaper. Thereafter, he spent 12 years creating private equity funds focused on the small and medium-sized enterprise sector in Africa, Asia, and Latin America with the Commonwealth Development Corporation and Aureus Capital. He is now an independent advisor to multilateral development banks, development finance institutions, foundations, and family offices on impact investment strategies. Noah holds an MA in Modern Languages from Oxford University and an MSc in Development Economics from the London School of Economics. Julia and Noah, I'm so glad you're here and uh, delighted to, to have this conversation about how you impact the philanthropic space with your knowledge of impact investing. Starting with you, Julia, it is astonishing that you were a senior executive of AIG and you adopted this frame of impact investing. How did you come to do that? Well, I think realistically looking back, it probably was the birth of my first child. I started investing 18 years ago in 94. Uh, I was with ABB uh, financing and developing large scale energy and infrastructure projects around the world, primarily in emerging markets. And there you kind of see that each investment has impact, whether positive in terms of saving environment and energy efficiency or renewable energy, or negative. We had issues with the uh, Three Gorges Dam in China, which had social negative impacts. And then I moved to IG and I was man managing direct private equity portfolio, which was you know, a glamorous job. But after the birth of my fi first child, you kind of think, what are you doing it for? why you're spending so much time away from your child if you don't do something which is meaningful. And I wanted to go into philanthropy and NGOs, but then I thought that actually combining the commercial approach with the philanthropic objectives in one would create a very impactful strategy. And that's how I started developing the Impact Investing Fund at AIG. All right. Well, our class takes a broad view of philanthropy. We talk about how you use your time, your talent, and your treasure to change the world. Now, Noah, mm. you've been uh, impacting philanthropy because you advise people mm. and entities on how they use their time, talent, and treasure. How did you become mm. engaged in this? I suppose it was quite a, a, a circuitous route, really. Um, by starting this part of my career at the Commonwealth Development Corporation, which was the United Kingdom's development finance institution, um, there had been a very strong focus on small and medium-sized enterprise development. Uh, and that, by the mid-90s, uh, had really sort of intersected with what we can now call the accession of the sustainability debate, the sustainability discussion, and came to be labeled impact investing. But the idea already by the mid-90s was that 
uh, by boosting and supporting growth in the SME sector. What is SME? Small and medium-sized enterprise sector. This was a way of promoting not just economic <coughs> development, but also private sector development, economic growth, and ultimately, potentially, controversially in some cases, uh, poverty alleviation. And so the idea for both of you is that the market offers the solution for alleviating poverty? Is that a fair statement? I don't know if I would say that it offers the solution. I would say that it offers a particular solution which, not speaking for Julia, but certainly for myself, is perhaps a more disciplined one in that it br brings commercial rigor to businesses that are growing and, and serving lower income groups. Do you agree with that? Um, I do agree. I would just add that um, there are certain social challenges that cannot be necessarily tackled through businesses. Social justice is difficult to find a, a business model. But there are others where if you find a sustainable, financially sustainable business model, you can scale and increase the impact tremendously because you're not going to be dependent on limited amount of charitable dollars, but you can engage capital and people who require commercial return to tackle those very acute social problems. And that's the beauty and the excitement about the uh, impact investing. Mm. Julia, walk us through an example of, say in the case of malaria or bed nets, oh. mm -hmm. in which you make a distinction, I believe, between impact and outcomes mm -hmm. and, and how you would convince an investor that this may be a good place to invest? Well, the, the whole discussion about impact and outcomes stems from the notion that you need to measure impact to know whether you're reaching the objectives. If you're an impact, object, uh, impact investor, by definition, you aspire to achieve both financial returns and social impact. Understanding whether you achieved your financial return is easy. You look at how much money you've invested, how much money you received, either through dividends or by uh, returning the capital. It's easy. How do you know whether you're reaching your impact goals? That's where the measurement of impact comes into play. And typically, what people would measure, because it's easier, is the outcomes. For example, to cure malaria, uh, a commercially minded social enterprise will sell bed nets. They would measure the success of their impact objectives by measuring the number of bets that they have sold. But in reality, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are curing malaria, which is what their end goal is. Because maybe those bed nets are not used. Maybe people buy them and go fishing with them. So you, there's not necessarily a direct link between the outcome, basically what are you doing, and the change that you're trying to affect with this investment. Yeah. Can you think of an example in which it is legitimate that you can merge the two, where, where, where the, the outcome is a good uh, substitute for the impact? I am a practitioner, so I always look at it, how much would it cost and how much of management time it would take to measure because measurement of impact should not substitute the creation of impact. So I would argue that in most of the cases, you should start maybe with simple key performance indicators, even if they mean focusing on outcomes at the beginning, and then wherever it's possible um, and doesn't take too much of management attention, you can go further and make more deep analysis. Yes, it's not perfect, but at least it will encourage people to start evaluating impact and I find impact evaluation is important not only in understanding what your dollars are doing but also in focusing the attention of managers be it a social entrepreneur or a fund manager to pursue those dual mm. objectives and not only focus on financial objectives mm. because it's the only one which is measured it's the only one that you are accountable for I mean, if I could come in there, um, uh, complementing what, what Julia is saying, I think that there are, there are several problems in this, in this area. One is that there has been such complexity acquired so quickly in the number of indicators that are being measured, the, um, 
the difficulty that it actually takes physically on the ground in Cambodia or El Salvador, wherever it might be, to measure these, these indicators. And additionally, what's often forgotten and I think Im Im implicit in what Julia is saying is that there has to be significant resource and time dedicated on behalf of the investee company to capture this data often, leaving aside the whole self-assessment debate in, and, 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 and conundrum, which takes time. And getting businesses to work and to grow in these markets is often challenging enough as it is to burden them further by asking for all sorts of qualitative and quantitative data. I mean, remember, these are companies that in some cases might not even have basic financial systems. is an additional burden. So we have to question ourselves as the practitioners how much pressure we're putting on these businesses. I'm so glad you said that. So let's get this question out of the way. You, you still believe that there is a role for traditional philanthropy that impact investing, the business model of working through the market, is not the way that we're going to change the world exclusively. You don't believe so. No, it's not that, it, no, it's not that I don't believe that. But I think that, um, I think that what, what impact is investing is saying is that there is a model. I don't know if I would say that works. There is a model that we are trying and that we are developing as a community that essentially says, with investment dollars and the commercial rigor that hopefully uh, accompanies those dollars, one can access issues of affordability, quality, access, choice, availability of key goods and services for lower income groups in a way that is perhaps more sustainable because the long term uh, viability and durability of the company in question um, is safeguarded because it, 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 it grows with that capital and, and hopefully lasts. Whereas there's always this question of when does the philanthropy run out, either because of fatigue on the, on, the, on the part of the giver or because that model is no longer possible or sustainable for whatever reason. I mean, is it life support? Julia, would you make that distinction for us between what Noah said, goods and services, mm -hmm. which seem to be a compelling mm -hmm. space for impact investing, mm -hmm. and, and, and other spaces like social justice? I would actually not necessarily agree with ah. no. I think that there is space for traditional grant-based philanthropy, but the focus should be more on catalytic philanthropy, on accountability and reaching, you know, really creating of change rather than, you know, spending, you know, writing checks. For example, you know, if you want to um, support children who are orphans, you know, very difficult to create a business enterprise, so charitable dollars will go to reach this goal. An important dimension of charitable dollars is also at the start of impact investing, with, when a catalytic new model is being tested, it may not provide the returns. So there is a time in the development of a social enterprise where they can only survive on charitable mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, an example would be um, barefoot power, which uh, provides um, solar kits for the remote villages in Africa, they sell them um, at $12, which represents three um, months of uh, you know, kerosene sales, and they last five uh, years. So after three months, the household starts to save money, they have tw 12 times the luminosity, they can start micro-telephone charging businesses, huge financial, um, uh, huge uh, social benefits. But they had to start with philanthropy because at the beginning they didn't have the distribution systems, their product was too expensive, it wasn't commercially viable. Now they entered the space where they can scale and attract semi-commercial capital mm. and then hopefully they will go further by continuing research and development, uh, expanding, creating economies mm. of scale and they can attract purely commercial. Mm. So I think there, there's still, you know, a, 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 uh, you know, a space and, and place for philanthropy. So let's bring in our students. Connor. It sounds like there is great work being done through this uh, framework. I just wanted to connect the conversation uh, to someone that we had last week, who's Harry Belafonte, very famous uh, civil rights activist in the U.S. One of the things that he mentioned uh, was that uh, traditionally he, he kind of conceptualized philanthropy as uh, the rich giving back to the poor uh, as a means to kind of offset uh, some of the social injustices that they have caused uh, prior to that. Working in 
uh, private enterprise and, and you know, especially launching this investment arm with AIG. Is that a criticism that, that you face often and, and how, do you, how do you respond to that? Um, can you define what you mean by the criticism of what? I'm not sure. The I criticism um, of uh, private enterprise capitalists in, in particular um, kind of leading uh, philanthropic initiatives uh, to combat social mm -hmm. Uh, injustice, which some people argue is in part manufactured by uh, a class system created by capitalism itself. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, yeah, I would ask, answer maybe in, 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 in several points. <coughs> you know, first, I think, yes, there is a lot of uncomfort among the philanthropists with the notion of, you know, receiving a return on the provision of social goods. So that's one point. Second point, the vehicle that I created within AIG was commercial. You know, it was focused on double bottom line, you know, impact investing, but we were hoping through private equity to achieve, you know, good uh, uh, financial returns. And we did have a criticism saying that it was impact washing, that the financial institutions just wanted to use it for the PR. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, at that point, um, you know, you know, it wasn't true. It was just a bunch of people who worked hard because they believe in it. And it was in a way very egoistic from my side because I felt very inspired with this idea. So um, for me, it was fantastic to work on it and push for it, uh, irrespective of what the organization was doing in, the wrong, uh, in, in, in other parts. And the fact that this commercial organization, which many said is not really prone to support it, has provided $150 million out of their balance sheet to support this initiative and was ready to increase it three times to do it, I think is great. So if we can move large commercial mm. institutions to play in this field, still getting the financial returns be because without it, you cannot do it, then I think the impact will be tremendous. Important is that it becomes their core business, that it's not the corporate social responsibility on the side driven out of the mm. marketing department, but they find ways to create new products for bottom of the pyramid, to drive their profitability and business life, and then it becomes impactful. Mm. I think to, 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 to complement what, what, what Judy has just said, I think the reality is that there is a spectrum of motivations, some of which we all might be more comfortable with and some, some, some of which less so. Um, from the purely cynical window dressing, greenwashing, um, marketing, all the way through to very enlightened understanding of the fact that there is an enormous market out there that by and large is, is, is larger in number than our traditional Western uh, uh, consumptive markets. Um, and, and therefore, it's, it's simply a commercial opportunity. Bringing it back to the sort of personal, speaking for myself, I noticed a tension at, at Aureus Capital, for example, where I felt that I was perhaps you know, more of a believer in that side of the mission than my colleagues on the ground that were you know, cutting the deals, as it were. Um, but then I made peace with it in the following way, which was if at the end of the day, between us, we are getting the dollars to move into these SMEs and to grow these SMEs, the fact that I might be more focused on um, generating as great social, environmental, uh, and, and governance impacts as possible. And they might be more focused on, on um, the financial engineering of the transaction, and perhaps the ultimate return. Wasn't the sum greater than, than, than its parts, and didn't we get to a, 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 a positive result that's promoting equity through social and, and public goods for all? Um, as opposed to, in, in a sense, sitting in judgment that other motivations weren't perhaps as pure as hopefully mine were. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think this particular form of philanthropy, uh, is, have you seen it uh, be compatible, compatible um, with, with other forms, maybe not as uh, you know, large coming from um, you know, large private enterprise? Is there a lot of partnership there? Do you even think of it as philanthropy? No. I, do, I, I don't. I don't think of it as a philanthropy, um, but I think that you know a lot of philanthropists and a lot of people who come from that side who are driven by impact are more and more attracted to this form of achieving the social impact. Mm -hmm. I look at it 
um, and we've discussed it a bit uh, you know, during <laughs> lunch, is that you can be a purist and you say, I want my dollar to alleviate you know, poverty directly. And you can say, look, um, I want 90 cents of impact per dollar of my investment. And I'm willing to give $10 to this course. Or you can say, let's find an opportunity where I will get good financial return and I will achieve 20, 30 cents per dollar of impact. But because I receive the return, I'm willing to put 10,000 of those dollars. You calculate your impact would be much higher. Because I think this notion of financial sustainability liberates huge amounts of capital, in addition to liberating also the entrepreneurial drive of finding the solutions where you're accountable for the products. If you give a product as a grant, say this the same solar lamp, you don't care how good it is. If you sell it, even for a fraction of the cost that you will sell it in the West, you're accountable to your customers. They have to buy it. They have to like it. They have to come, they can come back to you and say, this is really, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, make it better, <laughs> make it cheaper, make it last longer. And what is important, you treat people as consumers. You treat investees as partners, not as donation things. So it's much more empowering. But I think, I think also it might be helpful to look at it from the perspective of, of, of um, philanthropists that, that get into what we could now call the impact investment space. And I'll give you the example of a, of a family office in California that I used to work with quite a lot when I was at Aureus Capital and they invested in a number of our funds. Um, 80 people full time working on this family's wealth, a very significant family office. And the particular family member that did ultimately invest in a Latin America fund and an Africa fund um, had a very nuanced view of what she was doing and why she was doing it. So she had her philanthropy box and she was very clear about what that might achieve to many of Julia's points. What was interesting about the way that she approached this um, impact investing box, and this is private equity fund going into small and medium-sized enterprises, was there is an economic development story happening in Africa where we are, and Latin America, where we, where we are empowering small businesses with capital that they can't get from formal financial institutions. I am participating in both an economic development story in a wealth building story because these companies will hopefully grow and take on more workers and I am also doing good <coughs> in that broader amorphous sense. So she perceived it in its own right as something related to but, but, but different to philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marius. I just wanted to ask um, about what the, the role of risk and failure is within the realm of impact investing. You had mentioned that certain projects or um, things which don't have a proven track record, that is, that's the realm of philanthropy dollars and that's the realm of, of grant, uh, grant making. When, what is the point where it, it, it becomes viable for impact investing? Or well, is there, is for, there? For me as an investor, I think, you know, there are different type of investors. There are angel investors who may be willing to put even, you know, a risk capital to prove the pilot. But in many cases, if it's the idea itself uh, has not been, you know, tested, um, then, you know, it might be difficult. Um, so um, typically in impact investment space, because the concepts are new and they might be less profitable because there is a social dimension, a social orientation, it might take longer for companies to be profitable and they might not be exitable at the same valuations. Mm. So many impact investments are maybe not as lucrative uh, in terms of financial return or could be riskier. Every startup, you know, there have been stats um, produced about how many startups die. You can say that, you know, logically you may have more social enterprise startups that would die because it's more difficult to perceive dual objective and balance those objectives. But what I've heard and we've discussed just you know a couple of days is that social entrepreneurs who are driven by mission tend to stick longer with the company and not exit as early as maybe commercial entrepreneurs who would say no it doesn't work I have to fold and go do my next thing they want they're really driven by mission so they're willing to try and try and try so failure can have a different 
dimension. It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't work. One model doesn't work, you recreate yourself, you change the model, mm. you try another thing. So one of the mantras of private equity investors is uh, management, 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 and first business plan never works. So I think this mm. is even probably so much truer for the social impact investments. Yeah, I, I, would, I would actually possibly reframe the question or at least add another important actor, which is, uh, or series of actors, which is the development finance community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if development finance institutions really are being true to the D in DFI, they're called DFIs, um, then they are there to also play that catalytic role for models, both business and funds, so aggregated models that work as a, as a means of channeling capital to these um, emerging businesses. And so you'll hear phrases like first loss and guarantees where they are signing themselves up in some cases to lose 100% of capital in the hopes that, that some of these businesses that otherwise wouldn't attract capital, so correcting a market failure, will, attract, um, will, 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 will be invested in. Um, so it's not just, if you will, up to philanthropists. And there's a very vibrant debate going on at the moment within the development finance community about quite how developmental they should be. The argument purists say should be an if but for <coughs> argument. Were it not for them, this would not happen. So that's a whole other range of actors I would just suggest that we should have in the mix. And there are complicated, complex financial structures being built, which includes the different layers of mm. capital from development finance institutions, from philanthropies, maybe taking you know, the first laws, you know, to accommodate different risk and return appetites of investors to make sure that even earlier stage, untested uh, projects can get the necessary financing. And there's discipline that's, that's required on the part of the, of the development finance institutions. The International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, um, in, the, in the 1990s, became very, very good at saying, as much as we would like to invest in the second and third and fourth iteration of, of, of this fund, um, Bering's Vostok as an example, which is a very successful fund in Russia, um, which they seeded, um, it is time for us to bow out. We've done our job. This is now a billion dollar fund attracting purely commercial capital. So as Julia says, I mean, you've got foundations um, uh, uh, investing alongside DFIs, investing alongside commercial banks, development finance institutions, as I, as I just said. Mm -hmm. Well, since I can be disciplined, uh, Julia flew in from Zurich to join us and has to catch a plane. So Julia, thank you for joining us. We're going to take a short break so that Julian can get on, on her flight to Zurich and we'll continue our conversation with Noah. Julia, thank, thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you very much, Maxim. Thank you very much. Thank for you. fantastic questions. It has been fun. Uh, Farid? Hi. Um, so my question is, it pertained to Julia um, and the social business. When you put a for-profit model to a non-profit model, you're essentially combining two different um, notions in and, and one with the self-benefit aspect of capitalism and the self-sacrifice notion of non-profit. So how do you think that impact investing in social businesses um, balance that having to develop themselves with having to promote social good. What do you mean by the, the, the statement on capitalism? The, the self-service, self, uh, self it's more of a self... Um, sort of proxim yeah, profit yeah, yeah, maxim yeah, yeah. Yeah. maximizing. But I would, I, I would challenge that within the context of impact investing, which is that if you, if you are at all interested in, in I believe, C.K. Prahalad's argument, and you, 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 you see this as a sort of symbiosis, if you will, as an opportunity to combine both um, the servicing of an, of, of an unattended market with social goods that otherwise that so said market would not have access to, that they needn't necessarily be mutually exclusive. I mean, could I think you're setting it up. Could you give examples? When you say unattended market, mm. what does that mean exactly in some specific language? That means, I mean, let's take, let's take access to finance, for example people who are excluded from access to financial services. And who would these people be? These would be generally very poor people, often in, in rural but also semi-urban or peri-urban areas, who are discriminated against or excluded on the base of physical location, on the base of literacy, on the base of inadequate physical records, on the basis of lack of... Uh, land holdings, tenure, assets, uh, collateral, um, on the basis of gender. Um, 
And so by... So for example, peasants in Peru or Guatemala Peru or, or people, Guatemala or, yes. or for example, Sudan. Outside of, outside of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, you have a vertiginous drop off in rates of access to finance because there are physically no branches there. And depending on how that oscillates with mobile telephony, you either will or may or may not be hooked up to a financial institution. Take, take some, of, some of the investments that I've made in the past, where we've invested in, in, in financial institutions that are aiming to provide additional services to, to the poor, both in volume and type. So not just access to basic loans, but also perhaps micro health insurance, micro insurance more generally, crop disaster insurance. I believe that there you have, to, to go back to your language, perhaps that capital, it, capitalist impulse the investors in the farm that made that investment are looking for a return. But we're also achieving enormous social good, are we not, and potentially environmental good when we get into agricultural finance by extending financial services to these previously excluded groups. So I think, the, if I may say, the way that you set up the question is quite, is quite provocative, which is great, but I, 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 would, I, would, I would challenge some of the, uh, I hear sort of marks underneath, <laughs> underneath that, <laughs> screaming from his grave. <laughs> you have a follow up question. So we read Small Change, where the author criticized small businesses and their work in countries where inequalities exist. And you said that um, you're providing services to these people who would otherwise not have them. What the author of Small Change would say is that businesses ignore the fact or the roots of the cause of inequality and would rather just use um, the inequality to their service by providing um, their goods and by almost creating a monopoly. Would you say that this is? correct that businesses can't affect much past providing services, that they can't create the social movement and the civil society that's needed to remove the inequality completely? I, I actually think that that's a very myopic view of, of small businesses and their origins and, and, and how they develop. I'll give you an example. At the moment, I'm working with the uh, Gates Foundation on a medical clinic fund that they're going to invest in. I'm doing the due diligence for them. So I'm looking at, on their behalf, um, the viability of small businesses, small primary health care providers. Um, that is the only source, in, in, in almost all cases, for lower income groups of any health care if they can afford it in the first place. So I don't I don't get how someone can say you know, the, the, what, 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 what you've just asserted on their behalf. I mean, I, you know, they're, they're not exploiting inequality. They are doing what little is being done to try to attend an enormously overlooked, unattended, discriminated, marginalized group. So I think it's, I actually think statements like that are quite irresponsible. I think also you would have seen all sorts of changes and, and perhaps even unrest. If you, I mean, if you think about um, the fact that in many of the countries that we're talking about, the SME sector, the small and medium-sized enterprise sector, accounts for um, sometimes up to 90% of economic output. It just, it, it stands to, uh, that makes a bit of a nonsense of, of but I think, to that I th statement I think, to me. I think you are avoiding a question, right? What I hear implicit in Orit's question mm. <coughs> is it is, we, accepting what you said, mm. that you have expanded business services, even in healthcare. Mm. It could be in a system that's incredibly exploitative, yes. which there's massive inequality, mm. where women are treated as a, a, in, a, in a very suboptimal way. Yeah. You, that, it's not addressing that. No. It is simply addressing providing and expanding necessary services, but not addressing fundamental inequalities in that particular society. Do you disagree with that? No, I don't disagree. I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, I think that one also has to be realistic about how many issues you know, a single business can take on. You know, so for example, back to the financial services example we had before, when investing, are we going to work with that institution to look at uh, discrimination by gender and literacy and physical, you know, there's a limit to what each institution can do. But no, I think that is a, that's a fair statement. Clear. Okay. Uh, another one of the books that we read for class was Poor Economics, uh, co-written by Professor Bonerji from MIT. And one of the things that he discusses is micro-lending and how uh, the international development community has changed their perspective of micro-lending in the past 10 years. 10 years ago, it was sort of seen as the silver bullet for international development, and today we're seeing more problems with it and not really seeing it as much of a tool for poverty alleviation, perhaps consumption transformation, but not necessarily poverty alleviation. And I wonder, what do you think about this change? Is micro-lending still 
going to be the future of impact investing in impact investment or is it on the way out right um, many many issues packed in there let me take your last <laughs> statement first and I think that it is fair to say that microfinance generally let's use it as a generic term uh, was one of the first uh, areas or subsectors if you will that caught the attention of the both commercial investment community and also perhaps the philanthropic community foundations alongside multilaterals as this silver bullet as you as you put it so where impact investing is concerned it's it's sort of been there and been around the block i would i would point to two sort of um seminal moments within that one was was what Mahmoud Yunus did, um, and the other was a very big transaction where uh, uh, ABN AMRO Bank of Holland bought Banco Real in Brazil specifically to get access to their microfinance uh, uh, portfolio. So that was huge. That was the first uh, uh, um, uh, move by a commercial bank that was saying to the market, "This can be highly profitable." Um, I think that you need to unpack what microfinance is or has become and I think again underlying that criticism one has to draw a very important distinction between explicitly consumer finance orientated institutions that are providing small loans, small amounts of, of, of capital or credit and others that are doing very different types of microfinance or in some cases both. There's payroll-based lending, there's group lending, there are, very, there are many, many models. And one can debate the, the impact that any given model has. But I think that one has to look at those um, you know, separately from, from, from uh, financial institutions that are providing you a loan, for example, to buy a television or to buy a white good. Um, and that is a debate that we could have as to whether or not that's, that's you know, a good thing or a bad thing, but it is different. So I'm nervous about lumping it all in one. But do you agree mm. that there, 10 years ago mm. there was a sense that micro lending will result in such widespread business development that poverty would be alleviated? Mm. And the nuances that you just said, which is quality of life may improve marginally, people can own a television, people can do various things. Uh, doesn't reach to the level of what we would have considered alleviating poverty mm. at a mass mm. level. Mm. So what I hear you say is it is still a benefit and there are significant benefits, but that's a different question to whether it's alleviated poverty. Yeah, I think in some instances it can alleviate poverty. So I, I believe that more microcredit in fact where an individual who is able to grow a business um, to a certain level um, that then has impacts of the following nature, her ability to educate her children, say a, a, a female, um, her ability to spend more on healthcare and so on. There, there, there is no question that that can help to alleviate poverty. I think one of the reasons why it hasn't perhaps become the silver bullet is less to do with microfinance and more to do with the fact that the continuum of financing and financial services depending on or, or oscillating with the company as it grows that is available to us in our markets is not available to these very, very small emerging businesses. So if you imagine a kiosk that then gets their first uh, uh, access to a microcredit loan, who's going to take them next? The reality is that the traditional financial services are not willing yet to reach down and give that person their first $25,000. I think that's where we've seen a ceiling hit. Um, and so the scalability and potentially broader poverty alleviating impacts then, then hit a ceiling as well. And just as a follow up to that, a lot of this research was based on individual case studies in particular areas. And I wonder how much do those sorts of case studies contribute to your opinions, your advice about where impact investing should go? Um, I mean, I, th I, I think that if you, if you suddenly broaden out the lens to impact investing, you're, you're going from microfinance and you're taking in... Right, yeah. or just, just generally, how do you use case studies, uh, which probably are, are pretty centralized on a particular region, to inform your advice? Or do you? Or do you at all? Do, do you think it's appropriate to use a case study out of Bangladesh and apply it to Latin America? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think, I think one of the key issues here and, and one of the lessons that has emerged is mm -hmm. that the cultural specificity within Bangladesh 
let alone taking that model and applying it to Bolivia or wherever it might be is, is, is extremely dangerous and limited. And that brings us on to another issue which I always find fascinating, which is this current fascination and obsession with the word scalability. What does that actually really mean? Because there's, there's this worrying dynamic at the moment in, in the impact investment space that unless it's scalable, it somehow isn't legitimate. But not every solution can be scalable. And aren't we also then sort of denigrating and undermining very small local achievements and solutions that we're creating? So I, th I, I would bring that into the discussion as well. Thank you. Uh, Christina. Yes, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. We've read a lot of different views in our class about the role and the ability of the free market to address problems of social inequality and help these marginalized populations that you've been speaking about. We've read views about this idea of philanthropic capitalism, where there's this idea that um, people who have made it in business have hyper agency and they ha they're able to give in a way and invest with a lot of impact. And then on the left side, we have read you know, criticisms of corporate social responsibility saying that companies that are for profit inherently cannot, um, can, cannot address these issues of social inequality because they're responsible to their board of governors, to their shareholders, to their investors. So how would you address that critique and where do you think impact, your idea of impact investing falls in this spectrum? I think the reality is, I think the, I think the key word that you just used is spectrum. Right? I think the reality is it is a very broad spectrum and there will be some businesses where a, a, a more um, distinct and perhaps difficult choice has to be made between the impact and the profit motives and some not. And let me give you an example to, your, to the second half of your, of your question. Um, I'm on the board of a company called Clean Engines Incorporated. Mm -hmm. That company is looking to retrofit tuk-tuks. I don't know if you all know what tuk-tuks are, but they're the three wheelers that, uh, that you find in, in, in many, many Asian cities. There are an estimated one or 200 million around, around Asia. One tuk-tuk is responsible for the equivalent of um, 50 cars worth of emissions. Toxicity in Asian cities like Manila and Bangkok uh, uh, is actually starting to kill. What this company is doing is retrofitting tuk-tuks with clean engines using uh, LPG or, or compressed natural gas. Um, the moment that vehicle has been retrofitted, not only does the driver's income double, but the efficiency goes through the roof. The toxicity over time obviously falls in, in, the, in, the, in the city because these tuk-tuks are no longer pumping out the emissions, right? Um, there is absolutely no reason, and I don't think from my perspective, any of us should have a problem with the fact that this hopefully one day will be a multi-billion dollar company. We could also significantly, significantly impact pollution rates and health amongst the poorest of the poor urban dwellers, tuk-tuk drivers, in a range of countries. That to me is, is, is a pure impact investment win-win where you've got a sort of uber profit motive, if you will, um, and, and, and a lot of money eventually being made with an extraordinary private sector resolution to a problem which certainly the public sector and the government hasn't touched or been able to do anything about. But having said that, not every business has such a perfect symbiosis, if you will, between the social and the, and the, uh, and, and, and the profit side or the financial side. So your point is also well taken. That's what makes it so complicated. How do you, in your role as a, of advising, advising uh, people who have serious wealth, mm. significant wealth, and you can help them with your analysis, mm -hmm. guide them to purely philanthropic mm -hmm. ends, or you could advise them to invest in the tuk-tuk mm -hmm. clean energy example. So you can actually say in a bed net way, mm -hmm. get, say, we can save babies immediately by having medicated bed nets mm -hmm. distributed, or you can actually use your funds in this way. Mm -hmm. How do you make, how do you as an advisor make such a call? And do you ever find yourself trying to steer them in one direction or, or the other, or you leave it up to them? I, I don't find myself trying to steer them in one direction or the other, unless clearly I'm representing a particular product where I'm, where I'm trying to fundraise. That's a very different scenario. But I think that the, hopefully, the biggest impact that we can have is clarity and helping them to articulate their own agenda and priorities. And in some cases, 
although this can sound almost condescending, there is a blurring in their own minds of the, of the distinction between impact investing like the tuk-tuk example and, 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 and the bed net example. And even within bed nets, one could intersect in that in, in, in a more commercial way um, and, and in a purely philanthropic way. So I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to help them articulate a set of priorities in their in, in their activities that, that, that goes through the gamut of op opportunities by geography, by sector, by type of transaction. Are they interested in debt or equity? Are they interested in gender issues? Are they interested in, in infectious disease? Um, but I think that, in, to answer your question, in my advisory work, one is generally dealing with people, back to the example we used earlier, that have already in their minds drawn a distinction between what we might call you know, pure giving and something where they want to participate in an economic development story as they see it, and therefore can also get excited sometimes about seeing that money regenerated into almost like a mini revolving fund within their wealth that they, they can then put back to, back to um, use in another opportunity. I want to address the blurring problem, mm. because one of the concerns that comes out of the literature mm. is that for people who blur mm. uh, impact investing with pure philanthropy. Mm -hmm. It is shifting pure philanthropy into that space. Mm -hmm. And as Julia said in the earlier part of this two-part conversation, we still need to maintain a level of philanthropy that isn't getting a financial return. Mm -hmm. uh, are you helping people to, to make it very clear uh, what the choices are and the different endpoints of both of those? I think we would be irresponsible if we weren't, because I think what's implicit in your question and what, what is dangerous is that, and as Julia was alluding to, there are many socially orientated businesses that, were it not for philanthropic capital, simply would not get to the stage where even the most early stage, risk-hungry uh, impact investment vehicle would take the, the blindest bit of notice um, of them. So I think there's, there's sort of onus is on us as a community um, to emphasize the importance of, of, of both aspects. But again, I think it goes back to helping to educate them on the return, both financial and non-financial dimensions that they can expect from both buckets, if you will. Stephen. Thank you for talking with us. Um, so it sounds like we're characterizing the role of philanthropy to be this catalytic investor that then makes uh, impact investing feasible once it has once a an idea has been shown to be productive but and then impact investing is interested in um, addressing these ideas these generally goods and services ideas that are able to produce a profit and produce social impact but what about those areas of philanthropy like uh, malaria for example where there is no plausible way of creating a social impact investment. Mm -hmm. I guess what I mean is, so there are these companies that are producing bed nets, and there are people who need them that are able to purchase them, and that is earning money and creating social good, and that's great. But there are many, many more people who either because of lack of education or because of simple lack of funds are in dire need of these mm -hmm. nets but are not purchasing them. How is this not a case where it is appropriate for philanthropists to invest in a goods and service type um, project in order to address the sheer lack of uh, business model to address the problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that I think that there are cases like the one that you you raise where what has come to be known as, an, as, as the impact investing model, be it private equity or debt or whatever, simply is not going to apply. I mean, there are, and perhaps this isn't something that we don't really want to look at in the face, but I, I believe that there are certain um, social goods and public goods that perhaps the market and, and, and private enterprise in this sense is never going to be able to address in the way that you, you know, that we might hope. So I don't think it's appropriate for all sectors and, and, and problems. I, I, I actually agree with you. But Stephen's point, poses a paradox. Mm. If, in fact, there are businesses that are reaping profits by engaging in the production and distribution of bed nets, wouldn't philanthropic engagement with them undercut those businesses? How can you convince a consumer 
I can get this for free. Why should I pay you as a business, social mm. venture, business or whatever, for the same thing I can get for free? But look, at, look, look I mean, who are the consumers of most of these goods before they get to the end user? They're the World Health Organizations of this world and so on. So I think it's, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, no, I mean, fair, fair, fair point and fair paradox. Um, <laughs> I can't, can't say I have the answer to that one. It's, yeah. I Stephen? Mean. To, to your point, I would say that there are many regions of the world that have just not yet been reached by those organizations that are handing out free bed nets. And if I'm a person living in that organization, then, and I see that I'm not getting a free bed net, it only makes sense to purchase one. And while the facts remain as they are, I don't think that philanthropic efforts to get free bed nets to some people are undercutting the possibility for impact where people just are not yet getting those bed nets. No, but I mean, your, but, but, but your, your previous statements sort of implies that the person in question has sufficient dip disposable income that they can make that choice, that they will, they will buy or they won't buy. Well, there's not a free one, so I'm gonna buy, uh, I'll, I'll buy one. Sure, right. I mean, I think it varies from person to person. It sounded like Professor Thorne was suggesting that there are such people who would then choose not to because they could later get a free one. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. I yeah. mean, uh, isn't that, I mean, there are examples of that. Yeah, no, I, 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 and, and that's a problem, but I mean, I think it's a, it, it, the engagement of, of, of sort of NGOs and philanthropy and so on in that manner is, is deeply problematic because for two reasons. One, the, displacing, the displacement effect, which you're talking about, but two, um, and this is the sort of uglier side of it, is the motivations. Um, and that's a whole other debate. Well, no, let's talk about that a little bit as an insider. When you say the motivations, what do you mean? Well, let me give you an example of, 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 of sort of disruption that gets ugly. Um, one investment that, 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 that I was looking at um, when I was at Aureus Capital uh, as part of a healthcare fund was a, the first indigenous syringe manufacturing company in East Africa, in Kenya. Now, you have something very strange going on in East, in East Africa. Something very strange is happening where you have demand for approximately 800 million syringes in the whole of East Africa, if you imagine what's going on there, particularly at the moment, and you have supply of about 400 million, and they're being imported mostly from Asia. Um, they're being imported at about $2 a syringe, and they're being sold in some cases all the way up to $16 a syringe. Someone somewhere is making a lot of money, and I think we can all guess who. You know, these are, these are people in government and so on and so forth. But the ugly side of it is that the um, international institutions, sometimes the, the, the NGOs and, and, and other actors, even philanthropic actors, foundations, are helping to perpetuate this market um, failure and market distortion. And, and being frank with everyone in the room, I think one of the unfortunate- and Everyone in the public space in the public who space, viewing so us. I apologize who is <laughs> viewing us. Um, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the unfortunate conclusions that we came to is that particularly in the case of some of these more sensitive sectors like healthcare, and often less, if you like, impactful ones, often telecoms is a good example, in some cases financial services, um, I wonder, having had this experience, the extent to which some of these sectorally orientated funds, how far they can go. Because when you start to tread on those entrenched public sector interests, you suddenly find that the company that you were going to invest in didn't get the import permits that it was looking for, or isn't able to import the plastic resin that then makes the syringes that's gonna undercut that whole market. So it, it becomes very, very murky, disruption is murky. And, and just to flesh that, because they are players who are making a profit, perhaps, internally. Yes. So, so they, for people who are pocketing that spread between the $2 import price and the $16 mm -hmm. sale price, they have an interest in keeping the market exactly as it Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Julia, Noah, yeah. thank you so much for coming here today. We've been inspired by your intellect, by your passion for impact investing, and by your enthusiasm to help change impact investing around the world. These are the stories of philanthropy that are so important to us. And thank you, Yale students, for having made this conversation so rich and textured. Thank you for joining us. This has been Philanthropy in Action at Yale University. Now, please, what are you going to do to change the world? <laughs>